welcome to Outrageous Women. My name is Sojourner Kincaid Rowe, and I'm glad that you're watching our show. Uh, we certainly get lots of comments from the shows that we do, and we certainly appreciate your support. And this evening, I think we're going to have uh, uh, a very interesting show. We're going to be talking about Chicana, uh, Chicanas, and we're going to be talking about uh, the crossroads of sex and race, and I think culture also. But really, uh, we have so many things that go on in our community and around the state and around the world. I mean, they're all interconnected. But you know that Earth, Earth Day is coming up. Actually, it's going to be Earth Week in Santa Barbara. And you know that uh, Cinco de Maya is coming up. But this is, these are subjects and topics and an issue, I think, that has year-round um, significance. Um, but it's just uh, something I hope that you're uh, open to listening to and interested in hearing about because there's not very many opportunities for us to have these conversations in Santa Barbara. So I think that this um, is a really good opportunity. I'm real pleased that we have uh, Professor Antonia Castaneda as our guest. And Antonia is a uh, new, new to Santa Barbara. She's a professor at UCSB and she teaches in Chicana Studies and Women's Studies. So there you get it, the sex and race. So um, we're just going to uh, welcome you to Outrageous Women and you. welcome you to Santa Barbara. Well, thank you. It's <laughs> a pleasure to be both in Santa Barbara and on this program. Now, I've learned from talking to you that uh, you are uh, belong to a very small minority, and that's the number of Chicano women in the United States who hold a PhD. Uh, and probably in your discipline, which is U.S. history, it, the number gets even smaller. Indeed, actually, in terms of women of color generally who hold PhDs, the numbers are pretty small. Uh, so far, I've focused on historians, and as far as we can gather, um, and using statistics from the American Historical Association also, of Chicanas who hold PhDs in history, um, there's 10 of us. Uh, really? Pretty much in the United States, I say in the world, in the mm -hmm. universe. Uh, at least that are registered and that identify as Chicanas. I'm sure that there are other folks, who, other women, who may identify as Hispanic or who may um, have a Spanish surname, but who do not identify as Chicanas and who do not work on uh, Chicana or Chicano history. Tell us a little bit more about, you know, I'm, I'm sure that in, in Santa Barbara, because of the um, particular demographics here that most people are familiar with the term Chicana and Mujeres, et cetera. But why don't you just uh, give us just a little bit of um, glossary? <laughs> well, uh, the term Chicana, which is the uh, female uh, term in terms of Chicanos, um, it is a political term rooted um, most particularly in the uh, Chicano-Chicana movement of the 1960s and 70s, but ultimately it's a historical term, and it is, r as a historical term, it has meant um, somebody who is of working class origins. Mm -hmm. And in the 60s and 70s with the Chicano movement, the term was used to self-identify uh, people of Mexican descent uh, raised, if not born, in the United States, and uh, raised and feeling very much a colonized and or marginalized people economically, politically, socially, certainly educationally. So fundamentally, it's a political term. Now, uh, and then mujeres is... The mujeres, is of course, uh, means female, women. women. Right. So, and those uh, terms are interchangeable, except mujeres is mostly... Ref it is a basic Mexican word in Spanish. Well, mujeres is, a, is a, a word in Spanish that means yeah. women. Okay. Uh, it's the plural of yeah. woman, of mujer. And it's used, um, it, but it is used sort of across the, bo across the borders. Yes, it is. For example, uh, I think you're going to show some, um, uh, some of the works of Chicana artists, and specifically of Chicana artist Judy Baca. There was, during the 60s and 70s, a group called Mujeres Muralistas, meaning uh, women muralists. Mm -hmm. And they were a group of women of Chicanas and Latinas who did murals throughout, particularly throughout the San Francisco area, that combined images of women, women's work, and that um, worked principally with uh, representations and imagery of women in markets mm -hmm. and um, in Central America and the Caribbean. Now, when we refer in the uh, sort of in the women of color, uh, getting back to that vein, if 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 I refer to uh, women of African descent. Yes. Uh, throughout the world, I refer to them as Africans in the dis diaspora. Right. Does the <coughs> term Latinas generally refer to the diaspora? 
sort of? Um, I don't think quite in the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it more refers to Latinas in the United States, mm -hmm. but it is a term that many of us prefer over the term Hispanic mm -hmm. uh, because Latina still roots us more within what we now know as Latin America and the Americas, mm -hmm. whereas the term Hispanic is certainly more Euro-centered or European-oriented. And so the, uh, some folks, myself included, will use the term Latina or Latino to, uh, as an encompassing term for people of, um, uh, for Spanish speakers, people of Mexican ancestry, uh, Central American, Latin American ancestry. Now, you teach in the Chicano, stud Chicano Studies Department at the uh, University of California at Santa Barbara. But you also, as a student, uh, was involved in helping to bring about this phenomena of Chicana studies. Tell us a little bit about that. Absolutely. Well, I'm of that generation um, that um, I suppose what um, rammed down the doors, so to speak, uh, battered the doors of the institution in the late 60s and 70s to uh, be more expansive and more inclusive and to uh, broaden its scope and um, include underrepresented students, which included Chicanos and Chicanas, as well as uh, African Americans, Native Americans, and Asian Americans. Uh, I'm of that generation that um, helped to found and to develop Chicano studies as an academic discipline, but also who recruited uh, students of color to the institutions. For example, in the state of Washington, where I was working and living at the time, uh, in the late 60s and uh, early 70s, um, when I, um, I was the only Chicana person or Chicano person um, who attended two undergraduate colleges. There was myself and two African American fellows. One, they were basketball players, I think, and me. Um, at the University of Washington where I was working on my master's degree, uh, there were very few of us. So we worked uh, at that point with <coughs> EOP and helped to develop EOP and went out and recruited students and recruited the first group of 90 Chicano and Chicana students to the University of Washington. And that was in 1970. That was a short, uh, a very brief 22 years ago. Yes. Uh, prior to that, the University of Washington had seen one or two Chicano or Chicana students in its entire history. One of the things that's intrigued me, because I was in actually in uh, junior college as a reentry student uh -huh. in North Carolina uh, in the early 70s, and it seemed to me that all during the years that I was in school, um, that it almost was as if it were an, a, a, an extra subject, you know, the efforts to change the universe, to change the institution, to make the institution mm -hmm. be more cognizant. And mm -hmm. the fact that this was something that students by and large did uh, with various issues, most of them having to do with sex, race, or class, uh, but in but by and large, the United States in the, in America, the the educational systems have been changed by students. Right. Indeed. No. That's a, that's a really important point because uh, all of us, um, with very few exceptions, well, there weren't any Chicano faculty at the University of Washington when I was a student there. Um, we were all either undergraduates or. Um, MA students, in one or two cases, maybe PhD students, but even that was rare. So, um, so we were all we were all students, and uh, actually, it's still students who are struggling for many of the same issues. At the same time, you mentioned that I was teaching in, in Chicano studies, and I was talking about uh, being of that generation that started Chicano studies. I'm also, of course, in women's studies, mm -hmm. um, and many of the same issues are pertinent because. Uh, Although historically there have been more Euro-American women faculty than uh, Chicano or Chicana faculty, still getting women's studies started was, we faced many of the same issues of exclusion, of um, male-centered um, history, anthropology, and, and all of the disciplines. That fortunately is beginning to change. It is beginning to change. It's still one of the, it seems, it's interesting to, that it's, it's, a, it's a historical issue, the issue, issue of uh, women's studies or wom the inclusion of women in the um, just in whatever happens to be the the uh, issue or the topic or the um, effect of the moment uh, but you know just I go back to you know my name comes from Sojourner Truth indeed and even in um, the 1800s or you know in the 1900s when um, the women's movement <laughs> was, you know, Susan B. Anthony right. uh, and et al. were uh, lobbying for the vote, and Sojourner Truth wanted to be involved in that. Uh, she was not, they did not want her to bring her racial issues to the right. table. 
and that they didn't want her there because she might bring those racial issues there. And but the same token, men didn't want issues, uh, didn't want w women's issues brought to right. the table. Indeed. So and here we are, a hundred and some years later, and w w these are still the same issues. And we're still dealing with the same <laughs> issues. They're certainly <laughs> historical issues. Well, the patriarchy is certainly historical, uh, and um, and certainly in in this country, in the Americas as a whole, mm -hmm. the issue of race is a um, is a critical issue um, historically and contemporaneously. It's very much with us. Yeah. Now your uh, PhD, your doctorate, is in U.S. history. It is in U.S. history. So put that in perspective for us. <laughs> put uh, my doctorate in perspective <laughs> yes, for us. Yes, I mean, first of all, I, there's, two, there's two, two aspects, I mm -hmm. mean, two um, strains of that I'd like to pursue just a little bit. Sure. One, the fact that you, like many of us, uh, it, I, I thought it was interesting, and I hope you don't mind me sharing, that it took you Not 15 years right. to get your doctorate. Right, sure did. And could you give us a little, uh, w the why of that? Well, the why of that is um, back to the same issues that we were uh, talking about a minute ago. That is, I enrolled in a PhD program at, the univer at Stanford University um, with an interest in doing Chicano history. There was no Chicano person on the faculty, no Chicano historian on the faculty. Um, and I first, my, one of my first meetings with my advisor, and I spoke of my interest, and he said, oh, no, 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 no. <clears throat> Pardon me, my dear. Um, you should not do Chicano history. You're too emotionally involved. Mm -hmm. You're too. You're, you, you could not be objective. You could not be detached. And we must, of course, be objective in our historical uh, perspectives. Well, um, it occurred to me at the time, but I was um, just entering, and so I didn't say to him, "Well, don't you do white person's history?" Mm -hmm. um, but the the point is that. It took me so long because there was no support, mm -hmm. and there was no interest, and as a matter of fact, there was sheer discouragement. Uh, in addition to which, it was a constant struggle as I was sitting there in history courses, understanding um, that, uh, understanding the um, problematics of the interpretations and raising questions and constantly being dismissed. Uh, basically being told that the questions that I was raising had no value and that I had no authority to raise the kinds of questions that I was raising. Well, my authority was my experience of having grown up in a labor camp and knowing um, that wage labor was not as free as it is uh, presented in labor history. Um, and um, knowing that uh, the experiences, knowing f full well the experiences of a whole other segment of society that has not, and still really has not been fully projected in the history books, mm -hmm. both in terms of, um, both in terms of uh, working class history or the history of working people in the United States, and most specifically the history of the Mexican Chicano working class, uh, and certainly the history of women, and most particularly of Chicanas. Well, I wanted to. Um, um, bring in here just yesterday I was asking you pointing out this book illiberal mm -hmm. education which right. I guess is getting pretty popular I'm sure that most people who watch some of the national um, interview and talk shows have seen Dinesh D'Souza on some of the shows I'm sure. um, really uh, bringing up this whole issue of political correctness and, mm -hmm. and the so-called thought pol police and chastising the, uh, the people involved in the university systems who dare to say that you can't insult people uh, on the basis of their um, race or sex or sexual orientation or what have you, and really lambasting women's studies, ethnic studies, affirmative action, and anything that might um, uh, be what we would consider much more an enlightened approach, but in particular take an issue with this issue at Stanford is, was one of the main examples right. of what was included in the uh, required reading list and what would be considered great books. And in the past, we've known that those lists have been primarily, uh, to use your term, Eurocentric, or uh, you know, things that primarily came out of Western culture without the inclusion of the uh, myriad of cultures from around the world. And uh, so I was just uh, wondering, how has that sort of come into play in, in what you're doing and the work that you're doing? Well, uh, I certainly applaud the, uh, the work that has been done at Stanford uh, over the last few years, and they are, at this point, one of the leaders in that process. But even then, it has not come easily. 
Uh, it has been the, the, the work of a small group of faculty, um, but um, as well as the leadership of, of the president and other folks on, on the campus who were willing to take the issues. But I, I think that they saw that they really, uh, if they were to remain true to the principles of a quote-unquote liberal education and educating the citizenry of this country and most particularly of this state, they have to address that broader perspective. They have to be inclusive. The demographics of this country are changing dramatically. And, uh, and so uh, Mr. D'Souza and um, those of his mindset and ilk may well rail against, um, against inclusion, but it is an ideological position, and that's all it is. And it is a question and an issue of who has power, who holds it, and uh, who uses it and how it's used. And uh, people who have power are not often too terribly willing to, um, to share it. And well, you know, once we get, uh, you know, it, I like to think that, that each, each generation or each wave has its sort of agenda of things that it is compelled to work, work on. Mm -hmm. And for some it's the, the issue of inclusion, for some it, it, the buzzword is diversity, uh, for some it's multiculturalism. But wh wherever you stand, you know, I think this issue that I wanted to get us to, which is why I decided to call the show uh, The Crosswords, it ha goes back to a conversation we were having um, where you were talking about the work of some of the um, Chicana writers mm -hmm. who talking about um, uh, this, I this idea of being at the crossroads as opposed to being on the margin, because we've always thought of the cultures of color as being primarily marginalized, and we seem to, and you know, now people are raising the issue of moving, you know, of not viewing that as the margin, but actually viewing that as the center. Right. Well, uh, economically and politically, shall we say, as well as educationally and socially, on material terms, certainly, we're still mm -hmm. at the margins at best. Um, but what the writers, uh, I think women of color generally, are doing and focusing for the moment on Chicanas is um, they're centering their experience as Chicanas or as African American women and writing about that. So at this point in the writing, the issue of whether we're politically or economically at the margins is not an issue. Mm -hmm. The issue is that they are centering themselves and their experience and the experience of Chicanas or of African Americans or of Native Americans and writing about that experience. So what is at the center is that experience and that reality. And that is giving way to some incredibly magnificent writing uh, and expressions, whether in poetry, in essay form, in short stories, in novels, in theater, we're seeing um, the reality that women of color have lived in this country and the antecedents that we bring with us, whether we came here from another, uh, from another state or another country or whether we were born and raised here and are recalling our history and drawing upon it to, to, um, to create mm -hmm. and whatever the nature of our creativity is. And so that's what I was talking about yesterday in terms of centering and being at the center there. We're the subject. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's, al it's almost like whether you uh, see the, um, I mean, even if we, get, if we look at the, the physics, the physical structure of the world or the globe, mm -hmm. you know, I think everyone uh, would feel it would, be, it would be natural to feel that the world revolves around wherever I am standing. It might be, uh, does the world revolve around the sun? Does the earth revolve around the moon or this, or this, you know what I mean? And we get into the, we don't, you know, we get into these issues Frequently, for instance, in physical science, um, you know, which came first, the chicken or the eggs? But we don't often think about uh, our ethnocentrism um, when, when we're having these discussions. We always sort of see we've all, all of the books that uh, are held up to us, or, or the mainstream books, have one central point of view. So everything else is kind of must be revolving around that. And I think that what we're talking about now in this at this stage in the century is uh, rethinking, relooking. Um, and really repositioning to some extent, but a minute, much of it is how you choose to define that self-definition. It is indeed, but it's also not unrelated to where one is located, certainly economically, mm -hmm. because to write and to, you have to have some time, mm -hmm. and you have to have uh, the, po the economic possibility of not working, exactly. at least not working for wages for a particular amount of time. Mm -hmm. So it's still, a, um, it's still an activity that requires a kind of leisure 
time that we just haven't had as working well, class. Well, I think that also goes back to the point, I mean, <coughs> just in terms of time and degree. Right. And, and, the, and the length of time that I don't know whether anyone's ever done a study of maybe the difference in, in, in terms of pursuing um, a, an ultimate education or getting the degree that you're ultimately after. What are the correlations between that and your, uh, you know, class or economic wherewithal? They're 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 directly <laughs> correlated. Right on point. And, right there, and yeah. that's uh, Gloria Saldua, the author that we were talking about yesterday, the author, theorist, a poet, essayist, uh, novelist that we were talking about yesterday. In in fact, in that. Um, her Tongues of Fire uh, essay, she talks about, and, and her letter to, to women of color, letters to women of color, she talks about writing wherever, whenever, when you're eating, when you're, um, doesn't matter what you're doing, have a pen and pencil and write um, to communicate. Yeah. Well, one of the things I wanted to do was uh, to talk a little bit about uh, some of the art artwork because mm -hmm. I think that the art really presents a good uh, representation that people can see some of the issues that that women have chosen to deal with in terms of the women's women artists. Also, in terms of reading some of the books. Now, we you had mentioned Gloria and Zoldua, and in uh, one of the papers that you that you wrote, which has to do with the issue of women writers, women of color, mm -hmm. uh, you sort of use Amy Tan and Toni Morrison, uh, Gloria's work, uh, and others to say that the, this these are the people who are telling you, telling the world really about uh, what's happening. So. One of what we want to do is take a break. Mm -hmm. We have some videotapes because, as I mentioned earlier, that we have all these events that are happening in Santa Barbara. And one of the interesting things that's happening is that Judy Baca, one of the artists, is, Wonderful. is bringing um, one of her projects to town. Now, her work has been in Santa Barbara quite a bit uh, because she's done a project up in, up in um, Guadalupe, the Guadalupe right. Mural Project. And it was real interesting because she goes into and when she does her work and talks with the people in the community, so she really gets a sense from them of what their lives are about, and then, I, then her mural work reflects that. And so we're going to see um, a clip from um, a video fe featuring Judy Baca, and then we'll come back and talk some more. Okay, good. Okay. California, 5,000 people. This town parallels the history of the whole of California with its waves of immigrants. In 1989, the County of Santa Barbara Arts Commission and the Santa Barbara County Parks Department approached me to develop a public artwork for the city of Guadalupe. My research was carried out with the townspeople, who told me the stories of their work in the fields and opened their family albums to me. These photos have formed the first historical archives of the region. The town has remained relatively unchanged in a hundred years. I was struck by the people's continuing love of pageants and parades, and having found a photo of the earliest recorded parade, attended a contemporary one in the reenactment of the crucifixion of Christ held on Good Friday this year. I developed four murals for Guadalupe that will form a meditation site in a public park, which divided my collected materials into four categories. The first is the story of the founders of Guadalupe, the native peoples, the Chumash, the early adobe settlement, the community legends, all portrayed as the roots under the agricultural fields. We're standing in front of panel two which is um, two of four panels on, on the Guadalupe Mural Project. Second panel is the, we call the history, the, the ethnic contributions panel. Um, and it really has to do with the people who have been in Guadalupe, which is a really interesting myriad of a cross-section of, of ethnic groups that have peopled California for the last 200 years or so. And this is a, a view down Main Street, Guadalupe. And as you look to the far end of the street, you see both a combination of things that are really there and things that are no longer there and once had a presence in the city. So what we did basically is sort of combine reality and non-reality. This is Mr. Adianis, who was kind of a famous character. He was a grandson of the original Mr. Adianis who received the Mexican land grant that formed Guadalupe in, 18, in the 1840s. Um, Mr. Adianis' grandson was famous for the fact that he traded 13,000 acres for a bottle of whiskey and a saddle um, at a point later. He said, I, you know, I can always use the whiskey and the, 
the saddle is something I need right now. Guadalupe's major industry is agriculture, broccoli, cauliflower, and artichokes. Successive waves of immigrants and their cultures have imprinted the region. The native Chumash, the Mexican land grantees, the South American vaqueros, the Swiss Italian dairy farmers, the Portuguese bean farmer, the Chinese built the railroads, Filipinos worked the farms, Japanese agriculturalists, and then again the Mexicans, who make up 80% of Guadalupe's current population. But while agricultural technology has advanced, conditions for the farm workers remain relatively unchanged. Travel to El Norte is still the rough ride of the rails for many. They're bienvenidos to the United States. They come to substandard housing crammed many to one tiny room, vivienda. Work long hours for little wages, sometimes earning pennies for strawberries, el sueldo, while their bodies are destroyed by back-breaking labor, el dolor de la espalda the ever-present dangerous fog of pesticides, nebelina pelgrosa. All this they endure to send the money home to their fathers, mothers, wives, sons and daughters, ayuda extranjera. Yet the people of Guadalupe have hope their dreams spread wide like the wings of an angel. They continue to wish for the preservation of their environment and for the least turn and the sea otter. For decent homes for their families. For pesticide free and plentiful water. And most of all, they wish for their children that education will bring them the freedom of choice to be free of the hard work and pesticides of the fields. I think we're done. Well, I can see that um, that was just a very, um, I would say, a very touching uh, videotape. Every time I see it, it's really, and for you out there, I hope that you always remember that this Guadalupe is just in Santa, it's in Santa Barbara County. It's only about 75 miles from here, uh, and um, it just it seems like a, it's some other place, some other time. But it's right here. It's now. And I, one of the things that happened a, a few weeks ago, I was up in Sacramento, and I met a, a woman was giving making some remarks, and she's a native of Mexico, and she was saying that um, one of the things that she had felt is that in her culture, in her background, that she felt that she had been taught to think, of, you know, she had been thought to uh, be motivated by her heart, mm -hmm. and that she felt that in this country sh that you have to be motivated by your mind, mm -hmm. and that her challenge was to reconcile those two, because she didn't want to give up one, but yet she felt she needed to incorporate the second. So uh, I don't know what the... <laughs> well, I guess I would say that uh, certainly from my perspective that duality is ever present mm -hmm. and we encompass both of it, both uh, the mind and the heart. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that I think is the best of all of us. I'd like to use the videotape and that actually mm -hmm. that, um, that sentiment, that comment to um, look at a small quote by Judy Vaca because I think she exemplifies um, the incredible uh, scope and depth and breadth mm -hmm. of what Chicanas uh, are doing at this point academically, politically, um, artistically in terms of creativity at all levels mm -hmm. and, and that addresses our history and brings it all together in this very, uh, <coughs> pardon me, 
uh, brief quote in which she says, quote, my grandmother was a very spiritual, very Indian looking woman. I remember walking down the street with her and holding her hand and knowing that somehow we were walking down the wrong streets in the wrong country and we were completely, completely out of step with what was happening here. She gave me a tremendous spiritual force. I think she became the ideal of what love should be. I really find this the absolute foundation of my confidence. I know my sense of self was formed at that time. And that goes back to what we were talking about in terms of centering. And also her grandmother was a working class woman mm -hmm. from uh, Mexico. And so the notion of centering of our Indianness as Chicanas, uh, of addressing the indigenous part of us, the part that has always been dismissed by the society, um, pulls it together for Judy Baca, who then has never forgotten what those uh, class origins were and has retained her commitment and her creativity there, but at the same time has expanded to global peace, to global uh, environmental issues, mm -hmm. uh, to the politics of not just survival, but of thriving and growing in a worldwide community. Yes. Um, well, I think that this is very, uh, you know, it's interesting to me how, how, um, how much this is, in, this is the environmental movement, that the, 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 the people who work the kinds of material, you know, the pesticides issue right. and the, the health issues and the health conditions of people who grow the food that we eat and, you know, just the whole issue of dealing with um, farming and gardening and, and uh, grow growing of the necessities for the planet is so, uh, you know, um, it's, just so, it's just so what we are or what we should be. You know, I, I think that it's so much, I was m remarking earlier, that it seems to be so much a uh, subject for um, art to deal with, deal with or for people who want to express something about life or... Yeah. Indeed, I accept that as long as we don't forget that uh, that those pesticides are still here and affecting the people who work in the fields. Exactly. And, uh, well, you have to take it. I mean, I guess you know that's the whole idea. Right. Is what, you know, is what is art about? And it's, exactly. the, it's the issue that it constantly comes up. And people say, well, I want to do something meaningful, or I want to make a statement. But it is a way of expressing a reality. Yeah. Uh, and and I think it is contingent upon the people who view that reality to decide or to decide what is to be done about that reality. Should it be maintained? You know, if it's a, if it's a beautiful rose, should it be maintained and nurtured? Or if it's something that reflects something that's not beautiful, uh, should we change that picture? Indeed. <laughs> well, um, but now I want to ask, ask you about your classes. In your classes, do you feel that the people in, who come to study with you, with you um, uh, what do you feel their sort of orientation to this work is? Um, well, I think it varies. I think uh, both for the Chicano community, Chicano and Chicana students, and for the uh, women students who come to women's, the women's studies classes that I teach and or the Chicano studies classes that I teach, I think for the most part for, uh, they're anxious, hungry, um, excited, stimulated, interested in other perspectives. Uh, because although uh, part of the part of the back to Dinesh D'Souza um, to read his book you'd think that we were taking over the universities well mm -hmm. there's still very few of us yes. and so by and large the um, the courses that students take are still pretty traditional and so what they're getting in these courses is another perspective and I am a, a US uh, historian by training, I work on the colonial period, but I work most specifically on the colonial, uh, on colonial California. And so then that focuses on um, California as part initially of the Spanish Empire. I look at waves of conquest and colonialism, first at um, the Spanish conquest and then at um, the, when the period was part of Mexico and then at the Euro-American conquest with uh, the War of 1846-48. And I focus on gender and sex and race uh, and class and culture and talk about gender as a a central pivotal issue in the politics and policies of conquest and show uh, how, illustrate how it was central. I talk a great deal about violence, mm -hmm. the, the, the process 
of conquest and colonization of any people by any group is a violent, brutal process. And I talk about violence most specifically in terms of women and sexual violence. And so I do extensive work on the sexual violence towards Indian women during the Spanish conquest as well as during the Euro-American conquest. Could you make um, some sort of give us a little context for what, what was the reality of that? Well, the reality was that uh, certainly uh, during the Spanish conquest, it was a military uh, it was a military frontier and a religious frontier, and most histories of California focus on the missions and the benign elements of the mission. Well, the missions were basically forced labor in many respects, um, sometimes at the, um, uh, on the basis of, of, of um, ca corporal punishment. Uh, because the priests were trying to instill a whole other work discipline. The indigenous people had their own work discipline, which mm -hmm. didn't involve getting up at the break of dawn and working till, day, um, till the end of, of daylight. Um, it was seasonal and it was uh, in keeping with their particular form of hunting and gathering and so on. Um, and what I do with sexual violence in this process of conquest is to show that historically, um, sexual violence towards the women of the group being conquered is a historical fact and mm -hmm. occurs across time um, in a variety of conquests. And so I talk about that most specifically in, in California and in terms of Native American women and how then the fact that the soldiers were attacking the women uh, undermined the priests and the military's efforts to stabilize of the conquest of California. So then that gives rise to policies and to politics uh, in which they do try to stop the, the sexual violence because it has both political and mi military consequences. And also then the Spanish government sets about recruiting families uh, because initially it was single soldiers and then eventually sets about trying to recruit single women, mm -hmm. uh, single Spanish-speaking women as um, wives for these soldiers and single colonists who come. Mm -hmm. So I talk then about gender as a central issue to the politics and policies of conquest and colonization. And then I talk about, show how that is connected and how the issues are similar during the later periods, although they have slightly different manifestations. Mm -hmm. So that's how. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting um, bringing it back to um, um, the the present time is uh, rec uh, recently, um, you know, this is an issue, a really big issue. I think it's always been an issue. There's just been times when people whispered about it and would talk about it, but it's always been there. And now, now we are at the time where people talk about it. Um, one of the things I think that has that I wanted to uh, re tell our audience is that you're going to be one of the speakers at Take Back the Night, right. uh, which is being yeah. sponsored by the Rape Crisis Center, and I think it's going to be on May 20th right. uh, in Santa Barbara. Uh, the uh, second thing is that a few weeks ago I participated with Susan Fischello, who's mm -hmm. the director of our Shelter Services for Women here in Santa Barbara, uh, in a workshop up uh, for women for women's uh, with a women's conference at, UC, uh, at uh, City College, in a workshop that was entitled uh, "Envisioning a Future Without Fear." Right, indeed. And uh, it's just such an issue that is so um, something that we have to just. I think this idea that everyone is sort of focusing on this issue and saying you know, sort of we're, we're, we're mad as hell and we're not going to take it anymore, or we're going to have to take over the reins of responsibility for changing the, our reality in this area that we don't want to continue to live afraid to go out at night, yeah. afraid in our own homes, always afraid that something's going to happen because it impedes our progress. Um, Indeed it does. And uh, certainly the issue of, and, and I, back to your original question about classes, I address the issue of violence as a central force and fact and reality mm -hmm. in the process of conquest and colonization and how it is manifested, most particularly towards women, but also generally. And that, I'll use that to, to, to talk a little bit then a little bit about, for example, Gloria Saldua's work and the work of Emma Perez. Emma Perez is a, uh, an historian, uh, a lesbian feminist historian. Um, who talks about both she and Gloria Saldua uh, locate their work in the issues of oppression. Mm -hmm. And uh, Gloria Saldua talks about writing from the locus of intimate terrorism. Mm -hmm. 
and Emma Perez talks then about consciousness as deriving from uh, an intimate awareness of one's own oppression, whether that oppression is uh, in terms of sexuality or race or class or gender or all of the above. Mm -hmm. And that is the point of departure for right. discussing. And you were talking about fear, and as women of color, um, I, I, I would say that we live in constant fear, uh, if not constant terror, and not from my perspective just in terms of um, not exclusively in terms of sexual violence, although that is ever present, but also in terms of racial violence. Mm -hmm. Racism is, uh, is a very uh, debilitating and very brutalizing um, process, mm -hmm. and we live with it on a day-to-day -day basis, I mean, on a daily basis in one form or another. And certainly the class issues that our communities confront uh, in the society are, are pretty brutalizing. Um, and so for people of color, those issues and those oppressions, those multiplicities of oppressions mm -hmm. are, are ever present. They are. And it's, you know, and to take it back to the, to the next context, it is, as you've mentioned earlier, it is a global issue. Indeed. And uh, again, in Santa Barbara, this week coming up is Earth Week. Mm -hmm. I'm calling it Earth Week. One reason it's going to be next weekend, Friday and Saturday, events both days. But I think very significantly Judy Bach is coming to town again. Okay. And this time she's bringing uh, the project uh, that's called The World Wall, and which is uh, a vision of a future without fear, mm. vision of a world without fear. And what she's done with this is she's created seven panels herself. She's invited people from seven other continents to create panels. Uh, she's done brainstorming sessions with people in every community, and there's actually going to be one in Santa Barbara Wonderful. to uh, get the groundwork ideas from people for the completion of one of the panels. But we want to show um, a next segment of a video which, in which Judy is explaining uh, about the video, and I think it also has some footage in when she's actually shown part of it in uh, Gorky pa Park in what was Wonderful. Russia. Uh, the Soviet mm -hmm. Union, which is now Russia, but right. in Moscow. Uh -huh. And so here's another part of the video from Joe DiBacca, and when we come back we'll uh, discuss some more aspects of the con its content and uh, the subject of our conversation this evening. Wall is the next logical step in my work in that it applies the concepts I developed in the interracial work in American neighborhoods to an international level. Beginning, as usual, with a group process, the World Wall has sought the collective ideas of artists, scholars, students on a vision of the future without fear. The mural is freed from the conventional confines of stationary walls by a cable and poling system which can ship, pack, and be assembled into a hundred foot diameter circle anywhere in the world. In the summer of 1990 in Yonsu, Finland, the World Wall premiered in the Festival of the Midnight Sun, called the Meeting of the Worlds, where scholars from all over the world carried out a dialogue within the arena of the World Wall on pressing issues facing a global community such as our environment, disarmament, and a worldwide economy. There, a team of three Finnish artists added a new segment to the World Wall on their vision of the future without fear. This represents the first of seven works that will be added one each in the seven countries to which the World Wall travels, making it an international collaboration on a vision of the future without fear. A year-long collaboration culminated in the exhibition of the World Wall in Gorky Park in July of 1990, where 150,000 people viewed the work. There, despite the obstacles of distance, language, poor communication systems, the World Wall team led by the artist Alexei Begov, premiered their piece on the vision of the future entitled The End of the 20th Century. Even an elevator proved to be too small, and the work was lowered from a 15-story studio by ropes. Nevertheless, this work now travels with a world wall as a soul-felt expression of current Soviet sentiment. represents the fulfillment of a dream, not just for me, but for the many people who have worked to make this exhibition occur. We've brought the World Wall to Gorky Park 
Погода в этот день была неустойчивая. То сверкало солнце, то шел дождик. Но даже эта изменчивость не могла помешать стремлению людей к общению и взаимопониманию. Тем более, что путь, который выбрала американская художница Джудит Бакка, один из самых действенных. Ведь искусство всегда играло важную роль в сближении людей, независимо от их государственной, национальной или религиозной принадлежности. О выставке «Стена мира» рассказывает ее организатор Джудит Бакка. У меня появился страх, естественно, вот, потому что я писал всегда для себя и как бы от имени себя и выступать ну, в роли как бы как бы картина э, превращается уже от от страны. Э, After reviewing many Soviet artists' work, I visited the studio of Alexei Begov and fell in love with his work. His paintings were easily translatable to a large mural scale. What he was doing with his own work on the theme of the Soviet people waiting for the end of the 20th century was a perfect starting place for our collaboration on the vision of the future. The muralist art and, this is uh, and Dolores. This uh, is entitled La Ofrenda, meaning the offering, mm -hmm. and it is by Irena Cervantes, who's a young Chicana, one of the younger Chicana artists. It was painted in 1989 as part of a <coughs> broad mural project, and mm -hmm. it brings together um, the reality of women in Central America and the United States, of women of color, but most particularly of Chicanas and Latinas. And in the center then is Dolores Huerta, who is the vice president of the United Farm Workers of America mm -hmm. and has been a central figure in the farm labor movement as well as in the Chicano movement and the Chicano-Chicana community mm -hmm. for the last 25, 30 years mm -hmm. and continues to, to work very, very hard and is a major uh, symbol of um, of the Chicana movement and of Chicana activity and Chicana politics, mm -hmm. as you were saying. Uh, is it important to have uh, the symbols? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all. Need I don't know why I <laughs> ask a rhetorical question like that. I really wish I had phrased it. In a <laughs> we all need and have symbols, and um, what for me is so powerful, and why the work of the Chicana, uh, as well as of Native American and African American and Asian women. Um, 
their work, their creativity, whether it's in art or literature, what is so powerful about it is that the images not only are us and our mothers, but there are us and our mothers um, and our class origins and roots. And mm -hmm. so that the issue of people's labor, and per most particularly of women's work, of women's labor, in whatever form, whether it's work for wages, labor for wages, whether it's laboring in terms of birthing or whether it's laboring in terms of creativity mm -hmm. is now at the center and it is continuously depicted in terms of women in the marketplace, in terms of women in the fields, in the, women in the factories, women in all of their myriad activities mm -hmm. as workers, as um, uh, creators, as active agents of mm -hmm. change mm -hmm. and of history. Uh, so basically, your life work is to tell of this. Is that how you would? Absolutely. <laughs> my, my life's work, thank you, yes. My life's work is to tell of it because it is um, part of the history of this country. Mm -hmm. um, and, and still, half of the uh, population of this country as women, and then beyond that, the half of that female population that is women of color, and that is Chicana remains um, to be told mm -hmm. and to be analyzed and to be to be specified and that is really what I do is I'm doing uh, myself and other Chicana historians are doing the very basic uh, excavations mm -hmm. of what those lives have been about whether as farm workers as factory workers uh, as uh, any kind of worker as creators um, in the society and in the societies, if some of us were not born and raised here, then in the, the societies where we did come from. Uh, do you see an eventual circle? I guess I'm what I'm, I'm, you know, will we come together in terms of all the people, all the, all the women, all of the well, cultures? Is there, is the, you know, is the, the completion going I to happen? I have to believe that we will. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I think uh, it would be even more difficult to do the work that we do. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not too sure that I will live to see it, mm -hmm. in the sense that we do, from my perspective, still have to address the issues, our differences. Mm -hmm. We still have to address our various locations and positions of power. Mm -hmm. And we have to be willing to, um, to work through those issues and where and where some of us have privilege and power and some of us don't, and how we use mm -hmm. that privilege and power with each other mm -hmm. as women. Well, I want to thank you so very much for coming to talk with us this well, evening. Thank you. It's been I my pleasure. It's, uh, very, very um, uh, enriching. Uh, well, thank you for for our show and for our, the community to to hear these topic, topics discussed. And I want to say to you, thank you very much for, for, for watching the show every week. I hope you found this show very interesting and that you will continue to watch. Next week, we really are going to have a special show. And uh, so I want you to tune in. And I want you to re really, um, I hope that you will look, at, look around you and see the posters and all of the announcements because there's so much going on in our community. Next week begins Earth Week and there's just, uh, uh, the Judy, Judy Bachler in particular is going to be um, at the Faulkner Gallery at the library at 3 o'clock on uh, Saturday the 25th. Uh, there will be reception for her at the Sunken Gardens following that presentation at the library. And then the World Wall is going to be unveiled. So you'll get to see all of those images and go up and study them for yourself. And they're really uh, grand to behold in the evening. And so that's why it's so nice that they'll be at the Sunken Gardens. Then Earth Day uh, is the next day at Alameda Park. I know that you probably know about it already, and we're going to show uh, some scenes from previous Earth Days so that you can sort of remember all the good times that you had and all the consciousness raising that went on. And I also want you to look out for those posters for Cinco de Mayo. They're very, very interesting. It's going to be a, a two-day event at the County Bowl on the 3rd and the 4th, and the Santa Barbara Poetry Festival is coming up starting on May 2nd. And so we're going to do a show on the Poetry Festival, but you should uh, try and attend all 17 days of it and uh, continue to watch Outrageous Women and have a nice week. Thank you.
We are news people, news media. Earth Day news people. Okay, make it good. What are we doing? Making, making the engineer? Yeah, why not? We'll give it a try. See how it works okay. out. Yeah, come on and see the place. Come on and let me show you around.